e te tī, e te tā, e ngā karangatanga maha o te motu, nau mai, tawhiti mai ki te taumata kōrero o mata. Welcome to Mata with me, Mahinga Rangi Forbes, brought to you by Te Māngai Pāho and the Public Interest Journalism Fund. Well, over the last few weeks, we've been speaking to party leaders in the lead-up to the election. However, National Party leader Christopher Luxon has declined to be interviewed by Mata, as has his deputy leader, Nicola, Nicola Willis. So instead, we are joined today by National Party MP and candidate from Hamilton West, Tama Potaka e te tungani, tēnā koe, we're happy to have you here. Tēnā koe, te mārei kura e whakatau nei iau. Tēnā koe. Should Christopher Luxon be sanctioned for not turning up to this interview? Well, that's something you should take up with his office. Oh, we have tried, but anyway. <laughs> but more seriously, what does it tell Māori about the National Party leader uh, when he hasn't got time for Māori current affairs? Oh, I don't have any comments to make on that, but the scheduling matters are really a matter for his office. I'm just trying to schedule my own diary and make sure that I can attend these sorts of uh, interviews, but also get out amongst the hardworking people of Hamilton West. Kiri kiri roa ki te uru. Is it important, though, that you know party leaders turn out to Māori current affairs shows? I mean, we've got a whole audience that we, that, that we ask questions through a Māori lens and different kaupapa. Oh, no, I, I do think it is important uh, that the party leadership, no matter what party it is, does engage with... Uh, media from all uh, strands of the media space and the media sphere. So I hope in due course uh, Christopher Luxon and Nicola Willis and others of the National Party are able to come and join you on the show. We would love it. While we're on the subject of Māori broadcasting, you know, you could well be the Māori Development Minister come October the 18th. Does the National Party have a policy yet? I'm not going to presume anything about where I might end up. I'm just trying to win that. You are the spokesperson, right? I, yeah. I am the spokesperson on Māori Development, but... Uh, Certainly that any decisions, if we're lucky enough to be mm. part of and lead a uh, government in the next month or two, uh, then those decisions will be left up to our leadership yeah, and your to th Christopher Luxon. Your thoughts, though, on Māori Broadcasting? You've watched um, the Broadcasting Minister, Māori uh, Broadcasting Minister Willie Jackson, mm. you know, reform the industry, um, review it, revise it. Are you supportive of what you've seen, the changes, or are there, is there anything particular you'd like to have a go at? Look, I think there's been some amazing changes uh, across the media space in New Zealand, and there's been a, a lot of support uh, from the Minister. Uh, Minister Jackson, Jackson, and I applaud him for that support and for the mahi that's uh, been, um, I think, uh, the next step along the journey of Te Reo Māori mm. uh, and Te Reo Māori in the media sphere, and certainly the mahi that Morris Williamson and others did with the settlement of the broadcasting assets claim way back in the 1990s, I think showcases what uh, can be done together. Uh, that was then. We're moving forward now, and hopefully in the future there'll be something different as well. Not that I want mm. to have a hologram interviewing me, the hologram of Mihi interviewing me, but I'd, I'd love to see uh, the usage of Te Reo Māori, uh, not only on the airwaves, but also on the Papatuanuku waves. Yeah. Um, what is your vision for that portfolio, the Māori development portfolio? Well, look, uh, we haven't released a formal policy on it, but what I can say now Voting's is... Voting's begun. No, no, well, voting has begun overseas, but we're absolutely focused on the economy and getting the economy moving again. And part of that, I think, involves the Māori economy, mm. uh, Māori economic development. And you'll recognise that certainly over the last 10, 20 years, there's been a whole range of initiatives in the Māori economic development space. For example, tourism. Fantastic work uh, down at Māori Tourism. Uh, 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 Kaupapa, Māori Tourism Initiative, led by Pania Tyson Nathan, but also the actual tourism providers, agribusiness, places like We Peter Trust and the groups down in mm. the Bay of Plenty to Moana Toy, PKW. There's a whole range of things in the Māori economic space that we think we should be able to support more and support in different ways to get out and produce a really lively and vibrant economy. You are actually an expert in the Māori development space. You must have some aspirations for this portfolio. You are asking Māori to vote for you. Iwi leaders around the country need to know what Tamapotaka thinks about this space. Well, I think the, the main thing for us right now is the state of the economy, and we can only get ourselves out of... OK, talk to me yeah. about the Māori economy. Well, the Māori economy is quite uh, diverse. OK, you've got quite a diverse range of communities at yep. different places and spaces in terms of socioeconomics. Uh, plus also you've got uh, a number of larger Māori incorporations and trusts that are really land-based. And then the iwi groups, which many of which have uh, started to thrive under settlement. So you, there's a big difference, for example, between tiny group holdings, which is developing the largest logistics hub in Australasia, mm. and a place like... Uh, let's say Ngāti Pāwa, mm. which is just getting going on its settlement journey and about to finalise its settlement, and hopefully I'll be there to support that. 
So I think that there are those organisations in different places and spaces, but there is an absolute passion, commitment and belief by nearly every Māori that I come across in these organisations, the collectively owned ones, yeah. to do something really positive for their communities, both on the uh, driving fiscal responsibility and investment returns front, but also something for their people. And that's what, what we, we're about. What do they need? What are they telling you they need from government? Well, I think one of the um, messages that I get from a lot of iwi leaders mm. and also the incorporation and trust uh, leaders is just a, a moving of the dials to enable the economy to thrive again and for them to participate in that and really drive it. So the New Zealand economy has really relied on a lot of agribusiness and primary sector business over the years. We also have a lot of cultural talent, and I'll call it intellectually intellectual property talent, mm. that's also helped drive and thrive our communities. So on the land and the assets front, there are some access to capital issues, as you would understand. So uh, the ability of Māori to lend against Māori land, mm. the ability of Māori to access different, uh, uh, different banks, those are the sorts of things that can help Māori business. What's your thrive. idea? I mean, we've had, you know, we've had the great idea of um, foreign foreign investors putting it and coming up with a fund for it, you know, from previous governments. What's your idea? How do Māori access money so they can develop their lands? I don't, I don't think there's one idea. Mm. I think there's many Just ideas. Just one? Or, uh, yeah, I don't think there's one idea that's the silver bullet for that. Uh, but there's definitely a, uh, a co-papa called Land for Housing that was started under Nick Smith uh, National Government and then carried on by Phil Twyford and others over the last 15 years in Auckland where iwi can get together uh, and now others can get together and engage with the Crown around providing housing and getting some, uh, what we call it, low cost loan arrangements mm. to build houses for the communities that need them. Uh, so that's a great idea and maybe that idea has some applicability to other Māori land around the country. I watched your performance at the Kaupapa Māori debate the other night. Uh, you used a phrase which piqued my interest. You said, the politics of envy and high high should not drive the reallocation of wealth. What does that mean? Well, uh, you know, the biggest drivers of inequality in our communities in New Zealand are education, uh, health and housing. Those things really drive a lot of uh, poverty and a lot of inequality across our society. But there is sufficient, in my view, resources within government and at its disposal in order to address the inequality within those three dynamics, education, health and housing. And so what we would say is that there's been a lot of wasteful government spending, and I call that peak car wanatanga, rather than spending carefully, effectively and with some devolution where required on those three areas. That's not quite what that phrase means. What, what did you mean by that? Because well, you got hit up for it. Yeah. The, the politics of envy and hai yep. should not drive the reallocation of wealth. Well, there was a uh, tax report that was undertaken recently on yes. the 300 and so families. And uh, it was based on a few assumptions that actually, uh, you know, some wealth got one. could the be destroyed. The revenue found the wealthiest yeah. 311 New Zealand families are paying just 8.9% in income tax, while the minimum wage earner is paying 105 Is it poo high high to want the wealthy to pay fairer taxes? No, no. How I describe it is that that laid out some of the facts of the situation, that report, but it didn't lay out, for example, that those 310, 320 families actually pay 150% more tax than, than the average earner that you speak of. So there is a massive difference. But they are earning way more money? And not only that, they, that, the assessment didn't take into account the capital gains that were being accrued by people who weren't in that 320. So there were assumptions that were used in that report that weren't necessarily fair the same, or transparent. That report found yeah. that 80% of their wealth yeah. came from capital gains, 80%. But ca capital gains uh, accrues to a lot of people, including the people who they are being compared against. Not and those capital gains, not those if, capital not gains. Not if you're Māori. Not those if you're capital gains. You were a lawyer. You yeah. are a lawyer, sorry. Yeah. Uh, you've been a treaty negotiator. What mm. returns did Waikato Tainui get for the loss of 1.3 million acres of whenua? Well, they, they reached a settlement with Doug Graham, Jim Bolger and others of the National Party. Not only that, uh, they also received a relativity provision in their settlement. Now, that might be 1% or 2% of the total value lost, but we went through a process as a country to start the settlement uh, treaty settlements, and that process is continuing. There are still some outstanding ones, and now they're in a very 
positive and constructive position to build business and build into the so communities, and they continue to do they that. They've got less than 3%. And so yeah. are you brave enough to say that Waikato Tainui is pū hai hai um, for, for wanting a fairer deal? No, but the, I think that Waikato Tainui, and they've got uh, other settlement arrangements to conclude as well, uh, have moved to a space where they've been very uh, positively engaging in the economy, whereas 40 years ago, that was very hard for them. They might have had one or two farms. So, yeah, so I guess what we're, we're talking about, we're talking about the reallocation of wealth and you calling it envious and poo hai hai, when you, you're, def you, you're, you're basically defending the wealthiest people in New Zealand and saying that they pay way more tax than anyone, but they earn more tax. No, no, I think how I've described it, Mahi, is that the report that is used to uh, drive a discussion around the wealth tax actually is not as transparent as it should be. And there, we sh there should be some transparency, for example, on the comparison of the level of tax. You used, used one fact, um, fact, factual point, and I'm using another one around the 150 times the average person in that group, 150 times tax it's paying for, uh, compared to the average the average payer of tax. Now, that's are they just not a, earning 150 times more money? No, no, no. I, I respect um, I respect that, but I think we also need to respect that there are some things that were not disclosed in that report that might be useful in an informed conversation. Because I'm just trying to get into yeah. that. So, are you saying if you earn 150 times what someone over here earns, then you shouldn't yeah. pay some tax on some of that 150 yeah. times tax? But the, um, the no, is that what you're saying? No, what is I'm, that there should be like a cap? where you pay tax to and the rest you shouldn't pay. No, what I'm saying is that we should be more efficient around the use of taxpayers' money, which we do have going through the system at the moment, but is ultimately wasted on some pretty uh, harebrained projects. Like that's not what you dollar, said. That's like not what you said. You, you called people envious and poo high for, for wanting to redistribute wealth. I, I called it the politics of envy, especially when we don't focus on using the funds that are in the system and using the levers that we do have in order to sort the economy out. Now, we have levers. Uh, we have the ability to use funds through the taxpayer uh, system at the moment, but what we're not doing is doing it well or doing it properly. Hence, we have a broken economy, mm -hmm. and with that, society is fracturing as well. So where else could we get some money from? Energy companies what? have reported a combined increase in net profit of $1.3 billion. That's nearly 600% increase. And banks, they're making profits too. ASB's up to 11%. What about an excess profit tax? Would, would National look at one of those? Well, generally, I'm not in the same headspace as you about finding more money. What I'm saying is that if you own a government that spent another $1.2 billion extra every week compared to Bill English and John Key, surely we should have got better outcomes. But in fact, we've gone a lot further backwards in most of the most important things, education, health and housing. So there is enough they, money in the system. And there are some people... Them, they didn't work through COVID. Yes, in some, this, no, that's, that, that's, that's accurate. But in some uh, of your quarter, or what you're saying is we need more money, and the sum of my quarter is actually there's enough money thrown through the system, especially when the government today is spending 80% more, more money okay. than Bill English and John Key. OK, so we don't need any more money, but we have, you know, how well do you think Māori whānau are, 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 are doing in terms of incomes then? Well, I think that there's a lot of diversity across the whānau yep. Māori space, mm -hmm. and I think some people are doing very well, but many are really struggling. 244,000 uh, Māori are earning less than $30,000 a year. Yeah. So yeah, and, uh, should we redistribute or not some wealth to people who are who are doing it hard? Well, maybe what we should be doing is using the uh, taxpayer funds that we are getting through the system to better address some of the needs rather than wasting on harebrained schemes like the cycle bridge over the Auckland Harbour. And so Harbour. When, you get, when you get into government mm. in, on October the 14th, what are you going to do to raise some of those incomes and, and the well-being of the 244,000 Māori families earning less than 30,000? Well, I think we have to focus on, number one, sorting the economy out and sorting out the cost of living. And one of the things that we've said, for example, is we've got to get the immigration and related settings right so we can get people, kaimahi, back working in New Zealand. There are some industries that aren't working or functioning very well because mm. we don't have enough kaimahi. And you know about the health system as a great example. The second thing is that we would like to uh, give some tax relief. Now, we've announced that for the squeezed middle which you, you, you've heard of, the, our tax policy for the squeeze middle. Another thing that we would like to do... What is about the, the trampled poor? What about the 244,000 Māori that are earning less than $30,000 and you've already been yeah. here with your protein bars because you know that it's four bucks a week? I mean, is that fair? Is that really fair? What? You're going to give tax, tax cuts 
to, and you're concentrating on the squeezed middle, yet you've got 244,000 Māori earning under 30,000. Yeah, no, and I, and I respect your, your comment there, but how what would I would you, also... How would they cut yeah. up that protein bar for their dinner? Yeah, what I'd also say is under Labour, uh, you know, the number of Māori on main benefits has moved from 99 to 131,000. And so Labour actually hasn't created the conditions where uh, people can go to work and where people can thrive. They've actually made it a lot harder, particularly with, as I've described it, the large max car wanatanga over-regulated yep. economy. That's resulted in economic failure. Yeah. So what I'm saying is this, is that we have policies that have been announced. One of them has been announced tax relief for the squeeze middle, but I'm sure other fiscal responsibly, responsible policies will be announced. If you're going to fix the mechanisms or the machine or the infrastructure that's going to put the country back on track, I wonder how you, as the Māori Development Minister, would look at how you know Māori women are earning 23% less than Pākehā men. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's going to be, um, you know, is the tinkering around the edges over there going to fix that, or, or does that need something else? No, I think, uh, as we've described it or seen it before, uh, New Zealand has lost or is missing right now a bit of economic mojo and it's time for us to restore and replenish the cupboard because right now in the cupboard, in the financial cupboard of our country, we've got caterpillars and spiders uh, and we have to replenish it with the stock and we do that by activating uh, massive areas of business and economic growth like agribusiness, like tourism, like uh, other parts of our economy. So we've got to get going and get the levers moving so that our macro and microeconomic situation can improve. If we don't, how, we'll just get into more and more change, economic despair. How, how would that make any difference for Māori women who for a long, long time now have, been, have had an inequity uh, gap between them and, say, Pākehā men? Well, why don't we look at the record of the pay equity gap uh, comparison? And the Ministry of Women will tell you today that under Bill English and John Key, that pay equity gap for women generally went from 12.4, 12.5 to 9.4. And under Jacinda Ardern and Chris Hipkins, it's gone from 9.4 to 8.6. So there and, has and, been there has been And that's been the movement. universal lens. So yeah. ha if you put a Māori lens on that, what happened? Well, you put a Māori lens on that. Well, that, the Ministry of Women doesn't actually report on that. So maybe Was that's that something... Was that something you'd like to do? Well, I think it's something we should look at, yeah. So, so you'd yeah. commit to doing that? You're going to bring in um, better measurements around Māori income? And I'd be encouraging it. Yeah. Oh, fine. I'd be encouraging it because that's something that's really important to me is to support and tautoko wahine Māori and what they do and kōtero Māori. I have one myself and she's beautiful and as you know, I have a wife who's perfect. You are also the Associate Housing Minister. The current government promised 100,000 homes. They built something like 13,000. Um, if you were to take over the social housing portfolio, how many whare would we need? How much? How many would you commit to? Well, I'll get to a fact check first. The government said 100,000 Kiwi built homes and, yep. they, and they built 1,800. And then there were some social houses that were built as well, not only by the government, mm -hmm. but also by community housing providers. Yes. Look, we're not going to commit to a number of houses, but what we are going to do and what we've said recently is that there are a number of levers across the housing dynamic that need to be moved. We need to encourage councils to go for growth and to rezone, mm -hmm. and we'll give them some infrastructure support. We need to get the transport sorted. For example, you know, the Bryn Derwins and other places, 73 days this year that it was closed. Uh, some roading projects like the Southern Links and Hamilton. So this is about Cambridge social Gowdard. housing? Uh, all so those things go together, yeah. okay? So rezoning land, getting transport sorted, making sure building and construction... Rezoning land outside of... Auckland. Is, that, is that what you're talking about? Because we're talking about social housing, so Everywhere. where are you planning to put social Everywhere. housing? We should be encouraging councils to rezone, la rezone land in most of the big cities. So rezoning land, getting proper uh, roading links and proper infrastructure sorted, including the three waters. Uh, oh, let's talk about yeah. that. And uh, getting the building and construction sector sorted. So, for example, encouraging... Uh, councils to sort out their codes of uh, you, compliance you... straight after their inspections okay. and then social housing. So all those things tie in together on the social housing But no housing target, front. no target. Well, no, our target, and we've talked about this, is trying to end... No, what's the target? We're trying to end emergency housing and the, and the nature of that. And the target for the build? For the build, we don't have a specific okay. number. Our largest iwi ngāpu is yet to settle. You may be involved in the in, in settling the, the largest well, iwi in the next so. government. Mm. Did ngāpu cede sovereignty? Well, the, the Article 1 of the Treaty of Waitangi says that there is a cession of sovereignty, the English version. So you believe they ceded sovereignty? Well, that's what the version says, and those uh, people that signed up to it, that's what they signed up to. Do you go by the English version? No, 
No, I um, well, I actually I read it as a whole. Qu- I just asked you that question and you said the English version uh, I read says it as they a whole. ceded. Okay, so what's your view? Did they cede sovereignty or not? Or did they retain rangatiratanga? Well, I think it's both. So, and that's, that's exactly what the tribunal the dif- has said over time. Well, the, actually said the Waitangi tribunal said found that Ngāpui did, didn't cede sovereignty. Well, so are you yeah. saying that you know better than them? No, the no, I'm not. So did no, I'm not, but Sierra Jury and others have said over time that there is a uh, session of sovereignty and a protection of rangatiratanga, and that's what I hold to. So just to be clear, if you're going into Sierra Ngāpuhi, did you believe that they ceded sovereignty or not? All I'm saying is that there's a protection of rangatiratanga and a session of sovereignty. Who owns water? Everybody. We have massive issues across the Mutu at the moment. Queenstown is suffering right now. What about Parnell? <laughs> and the far north, yeah. What's the alternative to Three Waters and what will the role of Māori be? Well, I think we've announced our doing uh, local waters well policy and in there we articulate how we uh, think three, uh, how we think the three waters, stormwater, wastewater and drinking water, should be treated. Of course, beefing up and supporting Tamata Arawa, mm-hmm. uh, but not having the dynamic which has been proposed through the three or ten, I don't know how many waters there are, how many You boards. mean the co-governance element to it? There are. There is a co-governance element to it, but there are... What's your issue with this. that, the co-governance element? Well, what we've said all along with the co-governance is that... Uh, co-governance generally or specifically on the three waters? Well, this one, because we're talking about it. Yeah. What we've said is that it's a dangerous precedent or it's risky to tell communities, actually, we're going to move the manage- uh, the governance and the control of three waters that you've paid for, those services and systems, into uh, the decision-making authority of another group. And we've said, actually, we don't support that. In the event that there is community, council, iwi, crown support, like the Waikato River Authority, for something in the environmental space for a co-governance um, entity to be established, well, total. We've said that for the Waikato River Authority. And generally co-governance, yes or no? Well, co-governance in a treaty settlement space, which no, you've uh, seen like, I mean, like yes, Taranaki, his- like Taranaki, we know, Maunga, we know about the historic, River we, we, we get that in a, in a services space. Over public services? Over any services. Well, public services, we've said no. Uh, Have you always yeah. been opposed to co-governance in public services or is this a new thing for you? No, the, the, look, that's our position. That's my position. Yours, yeah. That's our position. That's my position. And uh, that's the position that we have. Now, has what always, we need. Has what it always we, been your position, though? Well, what, what we need to deal with. But is, has it? What's that? Have you always been opposed to co governance and a services. Uh, uh, public services? Yeah. Oh, I've, I've had different views over time. When did you change? It's well, important. I can't, I can't pick a specific date, like my birthday. I can't okay. pick a specific well, date. Uh, would you lend your support? If you were to be the next government and you might be fortunate enough to be the Māori development, who knows, you might be the treaty, you might be the Attorney-General, who knows. Would you lend your support to the people of Wakatū Incorporation who have the oldest property claim in the country? You know this, but for everyone else, the Crown, Mm. which you uh, you could be part of, will uh, will represent the numbers if they fall your way, has been instructed by the Supreme Court to remedy the case of Wakatū, who has never been given the 10% of lands the Crown promised when they gifted Nelson to the people. So how will you deal with that property claim? Look, I respect the mahi that my whanaunga of Wakatu uh, and Rory Stafford and others have been carrying and they've been carrying this claim for, you know, nigh on 160 years. Yes. Uh, they've, and been also, a, they've, been, they've been ignored for six years by this government. Are you going to ignore them? Well, I think them? they've been ignored by multiple governments. Are you going to ignore them? I'll definitely be uh, listening to them and sitting down and trying to understand where their current uh, cases heading because they're in a, in a remedies you, you, hearing. You know where the current case is. The High Court yep. has instructed, sorry, the Supreme Court has instructed the High Court to remedy the situation. Mm. So if you were to become the next government, would you be instructing or having a conversation on their behalf with the Nelson District Council or City Council, whoever it is, to start giving back parcels of their land? Well, I think that's probably a, a matter for the Attorney General to deal with. But would you than, support that, though? Rather than, well, we have to see where it ends up, uh, up with the High that's Court the at the moment. the point of yeah. you being in that party of yeah. Māori MPs, especially with yeah. your background and your knowledge. No. Ma- um, you know, Wakatu a, has been ignored for so many years. I can say I'm a very strong advocate for resolving long-standing grievances, whether or not they're treaty-based or uh, based this on other things. This one's a property claim. Well, so it's, it's a fiduciary simple. claim. Yep. It's a fiduciary claim, yep. whether or not it's based on treaty or other things. And I think that's the type of person that I am. But, um, you know, I, I did uh, reflect on a few things in relation to Wakatu, and they've, they've fought a very, very courageous and brave uh, battle with... Uh, Matuarore, Stafford and others, they have. And, and I respect that. Okay, so 
would you support yourself um, the, you know, once it gets down the track a wee bit and, and whoever the next Attorney General and the rest of it is, would you support them having land returned or paid out at market rates? Well, I think that's a conversation that will be had but as we go fair? through the High Court. Is well, that I'm, fair? I'm not across all the specific details, oh, so but I, can't, it's, uh, but, but, but I, I can't comment on it. But, but, yeah. I'm not across all the details, but I do know that there is there is some very serious grievance. The Supreme Court has made a decision around the breach and sent it back for a remedies discussion. Yeah, so you know yeah. that much. Yes. So is it fair for them to be paid, like everyone else in a property cl claim, market rates? Well, I, I can't, I can't Why make, not? Make, draw a conclusion on fairness. Just your own personal view. But I'm, I'm not across the facts and the details enough to really say, well, this is really a go and it should be dollars X. The National Party plans to ban gang patches in public because patches are designed to intimidate the public. How do you think the police would determine a patch? Uh, I'm not... <laughs> look. I mean, I'm for not... example, would the National Front, who are intimidating, yeah. or two tangata, the Destiny Church people, would, would they have to take their patches off? I'm probably not at the level of awareness or understanding how that would be determined. That's probably a matter for the police rather okay. than someone like myself. Um, they also, you know, want to have the opportunity to disperse, um, you know, gangs and prospects and the rest of it. And I guess for Māori, mm. they'd need a level of kind of protection because, you know, it, Māori are so overrepresented in all of those stats. How to... How, do, do you think that... Are you talking about the victim stats? Or the, no, no, I'm talking about... So, because that Māori are overrepresented in the victim yeah, stats they, as well. Yeah, they're, they're overrepresented in all of them. I guess do Māori deserve a layer, of, a layer of protection from this policy, which is going to target um, young people and, the, and, and police are going to have to determine whether that person's a prospect or just minding their own business? Yeah, look, I'd expect that to be a matter at the operational level, but my understanding is that the police throughout the country and, you know... Um, uh, I know because my brother is a police officer, mm -hmm. they have ongoing court at all with people from all sorts of organisations and gangs and other things, and they do that at a, at a localised level. And actually, I respect that because it's not my job or a parliamentary's job, parliamentarian's job to say, you're bad, you're good. We just set up the framework. Aspirations uh, for treaty relationships in 2040? It would be 200 well, years. Yeah, I think um, one of the things we talked about today was co-governance and, uh, you know, obviously the uh, National Party, myself, say so, over uh, public services, actually, that's really hard. That's not something we support. But what we do support, mm -hmm. absolutely support, and this is where the mana motuhage conversation mm -hmm. comes in and rangatiratanga, is devolution. So a great example of that, for example, is the Iwi Māori Partnership Boards in the health space, which basically have no decision-making authority and no funding so they're underfunded and under capacity. That was released in a report recently by EY. Okay. And what we say is that actually, don't worry about the co-governance dynamic. What we should be doing is powering up and supporting those Iwi Māori Partnership Boards to actually commission health services. Tēnā because right koe. now they can't. Tēnā koe. Tēnā koe mō tō haramai i a ki, ki taimata. Kia ora. Akati ko koe te mata i te hoanga kōrero, ka nui te mihi ki te puna whakatonga rewa, me te maangai pāho. Thanks for tuning in, we'll be back next week. Nō hōra mai. Ko te reo, te take.